Yeah. When we get going. There. <clears throat> right, why don't we get going? What I'm going to talk about today is uh, vasculitis. I'm going to give you a general overview. I'm not going to go into a lot of the uh, minutiae and specifics on different diseases. My original stimulus for doing this lecture, and the first time I did it was for the American Academy of Dermatology, was I myself found the nomenclature very confusing and conceptually it was confusing. It was very difficult to, to get a good grasp of what the diseases were, how to work them up, how to separate them. And what I endeavor to do today is go over some general guidelines and some clarification to allow you, when you go through your reading, to understand what's distinctive about this and what isn't, what's unique and what isn't about it. I have no conflicts of interest. Let's uh, jump in with the definition of a vasculitis because I'm going to show you things that look like vasculitis that, are, that have different terminology to them, vasculopathies. Vasculitis is a disease process. It's characterized by inflammation, necrosis, and hemorrhage of blood vessels. The signs and the symptoms that occur in vasculitic diseases are due to tissues and organs that are damaged by the compromised vasculature. The damage is mediated by ischemia, the fact that there's blockage of the vessels, no blood flow thrombosis, and the spread of inflammation to affected tissues. Now what's very confusing about this is that it can occur primarily, a primary disease or can be secondary to many different diseases. So you can have patients that have ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, hypereosinophilic syndrome, and a variety of collagen vascular diseases, and they can all be accompanied by vasculi vasculitis, but those are not primary vasculitides. The vasculitis is, is part and parcel to whatever else is going on. I should also give a disclaimer in that, despite what the textbooks say and the literature says, we don't really understand vasculitis at all. I mean, we can, we can posit certain things about it, but mechanistically, we really don't understand it at all. And I think that's part of the problem, too. So again, it can occur as a primary process. We'll go over those diseases, or it can be secondary to many different processes. And it may be restricted to the skin, or it can involve other organ systems, including the skin, or exclusive of the skin. And that's why dermatologists get involved with this. It's very common to have small vessel vasculitis that affects the skin, and small vessel vasculitis, as we'll get into later, can also accompany other types of vessel involvement, larger vessel involvement. So frequently, the systemic diseases will involve the skin, and they, they come to the, uh, to the office of the dermatologist, and we're the first ones to get involved doing it. It can be a clue that something much more serious is going on. So that's why we get involved as dermatologists rather than a rheumatologist perhaps giving you this lecture or an, or an immunologist. So there are classic primary vasculitides, and what would these be? Uh, Wegner's is one, uh, leukocytoclastic vasculitis. Wegner's, as you know, they've reinvented the name as granulomato granulomatosis with uh, polyangiitis. Uh, I'm going to default because I was raised with Wegner's. I'm also against the cultural revolution that's occurring throughout the world where we seek to erase the names of anything, anyone, buildings, uh, institutions, or whatever that somehow has a bad connotation to it in the, in the past. In colleges, they're reinventing building names and whatever. I mean, it's fine to know the history of these things, but I think it's silly to, to be changing things and, and erasing the history, which probably would give you less appreciation for the circumstances that you're concerned about anyway. So there's microscopic, and the polyarteritis too, I didn't update, is really polyangiitis. So on your, on your notes, why don't you change that? That's an older terminology. The old terminology, Churg-Strauss, which is eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangiitis under the new criteria. Polyarteritis nodosa, temporal arteritis, or giant cell arteritis, Takayasu's, and Kawasaki's disease. So these are the primary, for the most part, these are a, a fairly comprehensive list of the primary vasculitic processes, and most of the other things that uh, you'll hear about or read about are secondary. Now, in order to appreciate what a vasculitis is, you have to appreciate what a vasculitis isn't. There are many diseases that present as vasculitis can, and uh, some of these are termed vasculopathies, and there really isn't a good definition in the literature, and this is kind of mine, but it may be defined as a dysfunction or non-immunologic injury of small blood vessels or capillaries that leads to local vascular insufficiency, thrombosis, and sometimes secondary vascular inflammation. So when you have the complement cast or the uh, 
coagulation cascade being activated as a, as a secondary byproduct to that, you're going to recruit in neutrophils and mononuclear cells, and you're going to get secondary inflammation. But the primary process wasn't predominantly inflammation, which distinguishes it from the vasculitic processes. Uh, they're common. They may clinically resemble a vasculitis, and you need to differentiate uh, uh, them from that. Moreover, if you recognize them, some of these are significant diseases in their own right and uh, have some uh, <clears throat> clinical attributes that you may wish to clue in on. So what are the physically induced uh, vasculopathies? And I don't want to spend a lot of time with these, but these are mimickers of vasculitis. Cholesterol emboli, uh, purple toe syndrome, thromboembolism, atrial myxoma can certainly present systemically with what look like vasculitic lesions. Uh, Temperature-induced injuries, I'll show you an example of erythema abigni. We see that not uncommonly. Perniosis, uh, which is chillblains from cold-induced injuries on the feet. Uh, frostbite, foreign material injections, calciphylaxis, and, and et cetera. So these are things that can certainly mimic vasculitis clinically. This is erythema ab igni. I just show this to you because it, it's likely you're going to see this. It's a net-like brown pattern that's from a heating pad. When someone puts a, a hot object uh, on their skin for a prolonged period of time, it causes a vascular injury, and you wind up with this hemosiderin and hyperpigmentation. Eventually, this can uh, break down and deteriorate. Uh, I'm always amused when I ask patients, I do the physical exam, I say, have you been using a heating pad or do you have pain in that area? And they look at me like I'm crazy, but that's part of playing detective as a physician. This is uh, cholesterol emboli. Uh, this is due to a uh, patient with severe atherosclerosis, either having some type of catheterization where you jumble and uh, uh, disturb the atherosclerotic plaque in the uh, descending aorta, or they're put on anticoagulation, they wind up showering emboli to the periphery. Now, this is a little bit different than vasculitis. We may go back and show it to you, but this is what's termed a retiform purpura that if you use your imagination, you can see that they're almost like little net-like or finger-like projections of the purpura rather than a single papule. And that's an important distinction that I'll go back to. This is retiform purpura rather than palpable purpura. <clears throat> this is another example of a retiform purpura, and this is calciflaxis. Uh, this is calcification that often occurs in uh, a renal failure uh, where you get an acute uh, re or subacute occlusion of vessels and eventually necrosis uh, if you pay attention over there, you can see that he's necrosed the gland's penis, the scrotum. This is frequently a fatal process if it isn't uh, discerned right away. If you palpate under here, it feels like a rock. There's tremendous induration and calcification. <clears throat> purpura simplex, Schomburg's disease, or progressive, pur pur progressive pigmented purpura is very common. I see it in the clinic all the time. Uh, there are different variants of it. It's actually capillaritis. It's not associated with any other diseases. But what you see here is this brown uh, pigmentation and little tiny erythematous dots, little petechial dots that represent the capillaritis. And what happens is there's inflammation, the capillaries break, a little bit of blood is released, the blood is resorbed, it leaves a hemosiderin uh, deposition. The key here, however, if you close your eyes and run your finger over it, you can't feel anything. There's no palpability, as we'll get into, and that's a, a key component in diagnosing a vasculitis. So that's progressive pigmented purpura. There are thrombotic vasculopathies, the diseases of which you're familiar with, the hypercoagulable state, uh, factor C or S deficiency, factor V Leiden, uh, TTP. Uh, there are other things such as uh, antiphospholipid antibody syndrome and its various uh, uh, subtypes, Coumarin necrosis, uh, DIC, secondary to infection, Trousseau syndrome, uh, et cetera. So these also can mimic uh, that, that process. This is an example of DIC, a patient that had a splenectomy uh, and uh, developed DIC with uh, pneumococcal uh, or pneumococcus. And this again is kind of a retiform purpura. And, and this is, occurs because there's microvascular uh, clogging and insufficiency and necrosis and inflammation. So the small vessels are involved and you wind up with this kind of furred or net-like pattern that occurs with that. This is another uh, view of the same patient. Uh, you can see that there's a uh, uh, compromise of the peripheral uh, vasculature. I thought there was one more, I guess not. 
This is atrophy blanche. I don't expect you to necessarily remember this, but it occurs usually in people that uh, have va vascular insufficiency and it's an extraordinarily painful ulcer. It's not a stasis ulcer. It has a, a, a pain that is magnitudes greater than a stasis ulcer and it frequently heals in with this kind of uh, porcelainized white uh, scar that has uh, angiomatous puncta around it. It's a very distinctive process and it's felt to be a thrombotic process. There's septic vasculitis, certainly something you need to be very aware of. This can occur with a whole variety of organisms. And by septic vasculitis, I mean that the organisms themselves attach to or directly damage the vasculature or attack the vasculature. Rickettsia live in endothelial cells. That's where the action is. That's why they're attacking. And that's why you see the, the myriad findings that you do with wavering CNS signs, renal insufficiency and whatever. So rickettsia is certainly uh, one of that. Neisseria can do it. Uh, syphilis can do it. Herpes occasionally. Echo, HIV. There's a whole variety of things that you have on your list there. This is an example of a patient with Rocky Mountain spotted fever and they may present with what exactly looks like a leukocytoclastic vasculitis, small vessel vasculitis with palpable purpura. Oh, it often begins with the uh, erythematous to pink macula on the hands that spread out and eventually become hemorrhagic. And certainly in this area, you need to think about this around this time of the year and, and be aware. Uh, that should have been, uh, didn't move that, but that was the patient with DIC. This is a, a pustular vasculitis. Close up, it shows a little pustule. And this is chronic onychoxemia. You don't see that very often. Typically in females, it occurs episodically around the time of the menses where they develop uh, a monoarthritis and then they can develop these pustular lesions and you can culture GC out of these things. But there's clearly an intense inflammation of the blood vessels in a vasculitic process. Now, <clears throat> one of the mechanistic ways of looking at vasculitis and how it presents is by the anatomy. Okay? And you're going to have, depending on the size of the vessel involved, you're going to have distinctive changes that occur in the skin and other organs. And that can be a clue to what's going on. The most important thing is palpable purpura. And what do we mean by palpable purpura? It means that you have a, a purpuric papule, obviously. And what that entails or what that implies is that you have lost the integrity of the blood vessel. So it's leaked blood. Uh, and additionally, the palpability, the fact that it's elevated, is the inflammation around there. So if you have someone that has a coagulopathy or, or uh, you're treating them, you're poisoning them with your chemotherapy and they develop petechiae, it's not palpable at all. You run your finger over, close your eyes if you want to do it, and you can't feel anything on that. It's entirely flat. So that's an important distinction. Vasculitis is inflammatory. So one of the more common and, and uh, traditional uh, attributes of this uh, or distinctive attributes is palpable purpura. Now, one of the things I'm very amused at when my residents and students come in dermatology is that they'll go in and see all my patients, and they'll report that something blanches. Do I care that something blanches? I don't give a crap that most things blanch. If it blanches, that just means that the blood is in the vessel. Anything that's inflamed is going to blanch. The only reason that you try to blanch something is it's called dioscopy, where you can put a slide over it. The only reason you're interested in doing that is to see if there's hemorrhage in the lesion. So if you do that in vasculitis and you press on it, it ain't going anywhere because the blood's in the skin. And that indicates that you had hemorrhage. So that's one of the things that you're going to do is that you're going to see that it's actually uh, purpuric, that it's dioscopy positive. So palpable purpura is very important. And again, I would distinguish that from the retiform purpura, the little finger-like blotchy type patterns that occur where you get microvascular uh, injury on that. Uh, and I would also, again, distinguish that from the just hemorrhage or thrombocytopenia where you get non-palpable attributes. You can get superficial ulcers if there's ischemia, sometimes vesicles or, pulp or pap pustules. Urticaria or angioedema rarely can be a manifestation. Red plaques, uh, sweet-like syndrome, so hive-like uh, syndrome or hive-like lesions and splinter hemorrhages. And I'm going to show you some examples of that. By far and away, though, you're going to see the palpable purpura attributes of these. So this is a, a very typical palpable purpura. Obviously, this is in 3D. You can't touch it. But were you to touch your patient and feel it, you would feel that there's a bump under each of these things. And they're clearly purpuric. They have a bright red appearance. And <clears throat> these lesions are typically on dependent areas of the body. The theory is that if there are immune complexes, there's more hydrostatic pressure. 
on the, on the lower extremities. So typically, you're going to see vasculitis first or even uh, solely on the lower extremities. I'm not sure I agree with that definition, but, the, uh, but the, certainly the observation is entirely correct. This is, a, again, palpable purpura. And just as an aside, not, you can write it down or whatever, when you get these fusions of lesions here around the ankle, that's very typical of hennock schoenlein purpura. Another example showing the uh, purpura. Again, all these are virtually all these are lower extremities with uh, intense areas of uh, blood loss. Again, a, more of a purple appearance on the thighs, palpable purpura. Another example. And this is an example of palpable purpura with an infarct. Uh, that can indicate that a larger vessel is involved, as we'll go into, or it may be that, that vasculitides as a whole are associated with a hypercoagulable state. Uh, there was one article some years ago that purported that uh, when you do see infarction of the soft tissue in the skin, that invariably there's some type of hypercoagulable state. And certainly rheumatologists uh, have appreciated the fact that patients with giant cell arteritis and lupus with vasculitis and other types of vascular injury seem to be pre pre predisposed to DVT and other, uh, other types of thrombotic uh, uh, manifestations. And the work is still ongoing with that. It isn't entirely clear. We'll touch a little bit on that, but it's just something to think about. This is urticarial vasculitis. Uh, we see this not infrequently. It's fairly uncommon. When I gave lectures uh, nationally, uh, my audience looked at me of dermatologists like I didn't know, you know, where was I coming from. I said, you guys are seeing this, aren't you? And, you know, no one, they kind of shrugged and didn't say anything. We must be in the, uh, the epicenter for urticarial vasculitis because I see one or two patients a month uh, on average with this. These are patients that presented as hives, but they're somewhat different in that the hives, individual hives, will, if you marked one of them, will last 24 to 36 hours or more. They frequently burn rather than uh, strict itching, and they often resolve with hyperpigmentation or scaling, which is an indication of the uh, inflammation that occurred. And it can be a very problematic process. This is after the uh, hives have resolved. You can see the hyperpigmentation, which is a result of the leakage of the blood outside of the vessel. The explanation is, of this is that you get immune complexes that activate complement. The complement causes a, uh, a, a excess of C3A and C5A, which are anaphylatoxins that recruit mast cells and neutroph or mast cells and eosinophils into the area, and you wind up with the same general pathway uh, that uh, causes hives. You see the same end stage manifestation. Uh, you can get more necrotic lesions or pustular type of lesions over the vasculitic, but again, the palpable purpose is really visible there. This is more of a sweets-like where you get uh, urticarial plaques that are fixed. Uh, sometimes you can get unusual patterns that are still palpable but show the hemorrhage within the skin, positive and diascopy. Anyone know what this is? These are called bywater infarcts. And they're seen in rheumatoid arthritis. They're splinter hemorrhages in patients with active rheumatoid arthritis and they're the manifestation of a small vessel vasculitis that's active in that. They were named after Dr. Bywater who is a famous uh, English rheumatologist. All right, so by anatomy, you get, uh, we gave you the manifestations with the skin with palpable purpose, sometimes pustules, some superficial ulcers. When you get the deep dermal or subcutaneous small arteries, you wind up with deep ulcers, infarcts, a livido reticularis pattern, or, or nodules. So that's an example. This is a patient that had uh, rheumatoid vasculitis with medium vessel vasculitis that wound up with this infarct that's probably secondarily infected. Uh, you can see infarctions here. Uh, a lot of times if I show this picture, people will get uh, kind of lost on this and not see the other milieu. And to a large measure, ulcers can be defined by the company they keep. And the company here is palpable purpose. So by definition, it's a vasculitic ulcer. And that's what's going on. If you take that eschar off, there's a fairly deep ulceration underneath that. So that would be a muscular artery. This is a patient with lupus that has antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. When you have a livido reticularis pattern in a collagen vascular disease, uh, the large majority of those are associated with antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. So that's a clue that you can use too, though uh, it frequently will also involve a vasculitis. Uh, the larger named arteries usually present as regional ischemia. So you have patients with giant cell arteritis that have larger vessels. You can get pulseless disease. You can get a differential in the pulses between the two arms. 
Uh, you can get regional ischemia and occasionally dramatic ulceration. Nodules are common too, as with temporal arteritis, that you develop nodules in the temporal arteries. <clears throat> now, there's a confusing classification schema. There are different ways in the literature that these things are devised. You read different sources, they're all going to give you different ways of looking at this. And this is what's most confusing. So you have to realize that different people take different uh, approaches to this. You can define it by the clinical syndrome and say it's HSP. You know, it's lupus vasculitis, it's rheumatoid vasculitis, it's poly uh, microscopic polyangiitis. And to large measure, that's valid. But I think for you guys, at your point of, of reading literature, it's kind of confusing and not very helpful. Uh, you can do it by the size and the type of vessel involved. Giant cell arteritis, you know, involves the large named arteries where uh, uh, leukocytoclastic vasculitis, so the postcapillary venules, that's one way of doing it. Uh, you can do it by the inflammatory pattern, whether it's granulomatous or not. You can do it by the laboratory immune markers, whether there's cryoglobulins, whether there's IgA, whether there's immune complexes or ANCAs. All of those are valid, but again, I don't find terribly helpful. You can define them by the organs or tissues uh, and the immune mechanisms, whether it's a, whether it's a, a, a uh, immune complex, cell-mediated, granulomatous, whether there are eosinophils involved or not, all of those are measures that you can use. However, I don't like that. And what I'm going to propose to you is that it's my schema. And this is kind of a, a, a very similar to the schema that was adopted by the Chapel Hill Consensus Conference that came out around the time that I initially did this. And there was a, a second conference that came about a few years ago. But a primary, again, we're talking about the primary vasculitis syndromes that I gave you in the, in the front of this, can be classified on the basis of not the most common, but the largest documented involved vessel. And that, that's where I differ from the conference, consensus conference. They said the, the predominant uh, vessel. But I think it's much more helpful to look at the largest documented vessel. Uh, and the, the reason that, I, and whether there's absence or presence of granuloma, and I'll show you, there's a chart that appears next that goes through this. And the reason that I emphasize the largest documented vessels, that is in, in, in general, any pattern of smaller vessels can accompany the largest distinctive vessel. And that's why skin lesions are so prominent, because they're the smallest vessel, which means that as small vessels, they can accompany any type of vasculitis through giant cell arteritis. So you're, you're liable to see that particular manifestation no matter what the syndrome is. Then the other confusing attribute is that the kidney involvement. Why do these get kidney involvement? Why is it such a big deal? And I think the easiest and most simplistic way of looking at this is that the glomerulus is just a specialized arteriole. So it's affected just like all the other uh, vasculature in the body may be affected. <clears throat> so this is a review of your anatomy. I'm no expert at this. This is the afferent uh, 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 artery, the uh, efferent glomerular artery. Uh, this is the glomerulus itself, uh, mesangium. This is the parietal epithelium, Bowman space, the visceral epithelium with podocytes. Uh, this is the, depending, I guess, on what source you use, either the ascending loop of Henle or the distal convoluted tubule, the macula densa, macula densa and the juxtaglomerular apparatus. And I'm showing you this because we're going to show you the typical findings that are, occur with this disease. Now, this is a normal glomerulus. The pattern that you're going to see in these diseases, at least the ANCA diseases, for the most part is going to be focal segmental uh, crescentic necrotizing glomerulonephritis. Now what does that mean? Focal means that uh, not all the glomeruli are infected with a kidney. It's a spotty involvement, at least initially. Segmental means that only part of the glomerulus may be involved. So you may have one area here involved, but not these areas. So it's very focal in the way that it that's involved, and that's called segmental. And this is an example of early crescent formation. Uh, what happens in the glomerulus is that you get the, uh, the immunologic injury that damages the uh, vessel wall. Uh, there's increased permeability. Inflammatory mediators and coagulation proteins uh, get in there. They react to the basement membrane. They react to the tissue. There's activation of the, uh, the intrinsic and extrinsic uh, coagulation system, which causes fibrin to form. It also uh, activates the complement system. It recruits inflammatory cells in. And what you get is a proliferation of the parietal epithelium predominantly, the visceral epithelium. Uh, and you wind up with uh, fibroblasts and macrophages and other cells in there. 
and it essentially destroys that aspect or that area of the glomerulus. And what it, what it winds up doing is compressing the rest of the glomerulus and knocking it out. So this is fairly early on. This is more advanced crescent formation with a lot of fibrosis here and the residual glomerular apparatus kind of squished in there and it's totally uh, taken offline with that. So that's part of why these are so uh, concerning. Now, <clears throat> this is an important caveat with these uh, diseases. There's nothing unique about them. There's a tremendous degree of overlap. And you guys have the tendency, beginning medicine, to want you know, a series of, of uh, what do I want to say? You want, it to, you want a disease to uh, uh, satisfy a series of criteria and give you the diagnosis nice and clean. And that's not the way the world works. I will also tell you, as I tell uh, my residents and students, and every time I give lectures like this, the ACR, the American College of Rheumatology criteria that they give you for collagen vascular diseases is not meant for you, okay? It's not meant for the clinician. They set those things up for researchers so that they would have a homogeneous population of patients that everyone could agree by consensus had the disease that they were looking at. So when they did studies, it would, you know, they would come to valid conclusions. They're very narrow, they don't take into account all the expression of the disease, and they're not clinically useful. So you can't go to these criteria as a clinician and think that you're going to satisfy these A, B, C, ding. It's going to take a lot of detective work on your part uh, to uh, attri attribute a, a specific diagnosis. So the tissue pathology, the clinical findings, laboratory tests, the spectrum of organ involvement in these disorders is often not sufficiently, uh, not sufficient individually to readily allow distinguishing among the illness. It's really the total picture of all the findings, the pattern of prominent vessel involvement that usually allows assignment of a diagnosis and treatment. And to add to the challenge, some patients only have partial or limited expression of these classical syndromes and may have uh, features, overlap features of two or more diseases. So these aren't clear at all. And just like I'm going to go through these antibody markers, just like with lupus, an ANA in and of itself is meaningless, okay? If you have a nonspecific uh, febrile illness with arthralgias and you're feeling bad and you have a positive ANA, then what you have is a nonspecific febrile illness with someone feeling bad and a positive ANA. You do not have lupus. I can't tell you how many times I've had patients refer to me with lupus because they have something nonspecific and a positive ANA. Even if you have a family history and you have a positive ANA and someone has some arthralgias and other things, it's still not meaningful. You really need to have a number of characteristics that indicate that you have the disease before the serologies mean anything. The serologies alone are useless. The serologies will help to corroborate and sometimes refute your diagnosis, usually corroborate and not refute, but that's the utility of these serologies, so it's quite limited. Now this is kind of the key to the kingdom here. What I did was I divided this into vasculitides by different sizes, with or without granuloma, and you can see with the capillaries or the post-capillary arterioles, it's leukocytoclastic vasculitis. We're going to go into that in some detail. Uh, this is microscopic polyangiitis, not to be confused with polyarteritis nodosa. Uh, Churg, Strauss, and Wagner's. Uh, the Wagner's would be put down here by the uh, consensus, uh, the uh, Chapel Hill consensus. But I think that justifiably my system is up there and we're not going to talk really about those. So let's talk about leukocytoclastic vasculitis, small vessel vasculitis. This is mostly what you're going to see. Uh, it's usually in the lower extremities. It's dependent because of the, uh, the, the uh, uh, what do I want to say, pressure forces, hydrostatic forces that we alluded to earlier. The pathologist uses a number of things. Predominantly, they're talk, they, they look for neutrophil inflammation or in, infiltration in the, in the vessel wall and leukocytoclasis, nuclear dust. The neutrophils are reacting to whatever's going on in there, and they blow apart, and they leave a lot of what looks like pepper on the slide, and that's quite characteristic. Secondarily, they can look for vascular wall, wall injury. Fibrinoid changes are very important. The rest of these are really secondary, certainly red blood cell extravasation, and then you can do immunostain. This is an example of leukocytoclastic vasculitis. There's a lot of uh, dis uh, uh, damage or uh, destruction of the vessel wall here, which is kind of smudged out. You can see the fibrinoid changes here, uh, and there's a kind of a, uh, a dotty look to it, a peppery look, which is leukocytoclasis. Uh, 
Uh, this can be leukocytoclastic vasculitis can be primary, again, idiopathic, or it can occur with a lot of different distinctive diseases. There are distinctive syndromes that I'm not going to go into. Uh, HSP, which is IgA, the urticarial vasculitis I mentioned uh, uh, in passing, and there are some uh, further obscure diseases from a medical standpoint that we as dermatologists deal with. Now, there are lots of secondary causes for this, which means it's not going to be a primary dermatitis. The usual things we look for are going to be drugs, infections with exogenous antigens, uh, cryoglobulinemia can present that way. You can see it in auto-inflammatory syndromes, solid tumors, uh, lymphoreticular malignancies. Uh, so again, these, there are lots of diseases that secondarily will be associated with vasculitis, but they're not the primary lesion. The pathogenesis of vasculitic syndromes is felt to be predominantly either humoral or cell-mediated. If it's humoral, uh, the idea is that they're either immune complexes or ANCAs, which we're going to talk about in a minute. Cell-mediated can be a T-cell response or a T-cell with granuloma formation. So that's the mechanism of injury that can give you some clue as to what's going on. Now, the idiopathogenesis of small vessel vasculitis in all ALL capital, the textbooks, is an immune complex disease. I don't think that's true. There's very little, I think, to support this. It gets repeated uh, over and over again. The idea is that you form immune complexes of intermediate size. Why is that important? Because if you form small immune complexes, they get washed out in the kidney. If you form large immune complexes, they deposit in the vessels and get gobbled up by macrophages. It's the intermediate ones that float around and manage by mechanisms that aren't clear right now to get in the vessel wall. They fix complement. They uh, recruit neutrophils, and neutrophils are activated. They don't really like immune complexes. They barf up their little enzymes, and they dissolve the vessel wall, and that's how uh, you get this. There's very little, really, to support this, and it's based on very circumstantial data. Uh, what are the problems with the immune complex theory? Uh, there are other positive, there are often positive tests in the serum for, for immune complexes in many different diseases. Uh, there's uh, immunostaining and damage and any damaged vessel for with uh, IgG's in complement because it can get in. Uh, so certainly this is the argument for it that the tests are often positive. Raji cell, C1Q, other uh, rheumatoid factor, other uh, uh, tests for immune complexes, and you do get the immunostaining. Patients will say, or, or the physicians will say, do a biopsy. The pathologist will say, there's, uh, you know, there's uh, immunoglobulin and complement in the vessels. It's positive. However, what you need to realize is that there are areas of immunostaining that occur in, on uh, skin nearby without uh, any damage at all. Usually, you don't find any antigen or, inf or inciting uh, uh, immunologic inciting uh, a drug. Uh, you can get an identical histopathology and other vasculitides that are proposed not to be immune complexes. Uh, the antibodies in common may be reacting to the exposed vascular antigens that are otherwise not uh, present. <clears throat> and, and one of the biggest arguments, I, I think, that no one has really addressed is that serum sickness is kind of the Godzilla of immune complex disorders. And the one thing you don't see in serum sickness is vasculitis. So if you give sheep antithymocyte globulin to a patient with cancer or to a patient with a transplant, not infrequently they'll develop serum sickness, but they don't get, uh, they don't get leukocytoclastic vasculitis. This is an example of serum sickness. This is a kid that got stung by about 17 or 18 yellow jackets a week prior to my seeing him and developed these urticaria-like lesions. He had fever, arthralgias, uh, you can get lymphadenopathy, and you can get an active renal sediment with it. So what is the pathogenesis of these things? We're not really clear. It's possibly immune complexes in the small uh, vessels. It may be antibody mediated in the medium vessels with C anchor or P anchor, which we'll discuss. Or it could be T cell mediated in the vessels that are larger with granuloma formation. We don't really know. Now what about ANCAs? Because they've kind of been the hot topic over the past 10 or 15 years. ANCAs are a serologic marker. They're anti-neutrophil uh, cytoplasmic IgG antibodies. They're targeted to protein determinants within the neutrophils and monocytes that may be useful markers for several different multisystemic uh, necrotizing vasculitic processes. The anchors are associated with Wagner's, microscopic polyarteritis, Churg Strauss, and with rapidly pro progressive uh, crescentic glomerulonephritis, which may be a renal limited form of vasculitis. So those are the four diseases. They're useful in classification and corroboration and may be pathologic. They may be etiologic in the damage. However, they do not make the diagnosis any more than ANAs make the diagnosis in collagen vascular disease. 
So alone, they're useless. Occurring in a syndrome that looks like a particular type of vasculitis, they can be very supportive. How do we define these? Originally, it was done by indirect immunofluorescence on alcohol-fixed neutrophils. This is important because if you put neutrophils or any tissue in formalin, the formalin binds everything, destroys all the reactive, the chemically reactive ligands within the tissue, and you don't get any reaction at all. The alcohol doesn't do that. And uh, what happens is that the, uh, the antibodies are able to get into the neutrophils and they bind wherever these particular antigens are located and that's what gives you the pattern. The interpretation is observer dependent and it should always be confirmed with an enzyme immunoassay and now there's second and third generation ELISAs that you're gonna wanna order on that. So there are two of these. There's a cytoplasmic or a C anchor. This is a 29 kilodalton serine protease. It's found in the xerophilic myeloid granules and has been determined to be proteinase 3. There's a P anchor or perinuclear. It's usually a cationic pro, uh, protein. And I say usually because there are a number of these, but the ones that are most significant is the myeloperoxidase, also found in azurophilic uh, granules. There are also atypical anchors that may mimic the pattern. These are things like to LAMP2, lysosome associated membrane protein 2, lactoferrin, uh, cathepsin G, and a couple of others that are of less significance. So when you read the literature, a C anca is the same as a PR3, a proteinase 3 anca. A P or perinuclear anca is the same as myeloperoxidase. That's the target of this. And this is what you see. This is a C anca where the, uh, the cytoplasm is all lit up. The nucleus occurs in silhouette. And this is a P anca where it binds to the periphery of the nucleus. The reason is that it's a cationic protein. And the nucleus, the nuclear membrane is electronegative on the outside, so it's attracted there and it binds there. It's an artifact of binding, but it's clinically useful. And that's why you can't use formalin with this. So what is C anchor good for? C anchor is highly specific for Wegner's. It can occur also in microscopic polyarteritis and is only occasionally positive in other systemic diseases. It's rarely seen in drug-induced uh, uh, vasculitis, uh, uh, levamisil is an example of that. PTU can cause that. This is when we talk about the vasculitis where the cocaine is cut with uh, levamisil. That's what you're talking about, and it's usually C anchor positive in that instance. It's positive in 40 to 50 percent of patients with renal limited, idiopathic, rapidly progressive uh, glomerulonephritis, which may be Wegner's spectrum. <clears throat> and the C anchors may be pathogenic in the disease, and that's kind of interesting. Mechanism isn't clear, but there's some evidence that neutrophils, when neutrophils are activated, they'll express myeloperoxidase and PR3 and other enzymes on their surface as part of the activation. And when the ANCAs bind to this, they stimulate a respiratory burst and degranulation of the leukocytes, which may cause damage in the area. So in that regard, they may, be, they may activate the neutrophils and cause the damage. Additionally, there's an aspect of what's called NETS now, which is a relatively new concept in allergy immunology that's neutrophil extracellular traps. <clears throat> it's kind of an interesting concept, but as neutrophils are going down, fighting the, uh, uh, the bacteria and whatever they're going against, when they're totally exhausted and they're about to go under, what they'll do is essentially explode. And when they explode, they release their DNA in histones, which is like throwing, it's like casting a, a net over everything. It binds everything up. It activates the coagulation cascade, which may promote, <coughs> excuse me, thrombosis to a degree, but it's gonna activate complement and it's gonna help in the destruction of whatever is attacking you. However, if it's activated uh, gratuitously, it's also gonna cause damage in the vessel wall, so that may be another mechanism that's going on. <clears throat> so anyway, they may be pathogenic in the disease process. The levels, however, are not useful in correlating with disease activity. The fact that they go down or up really doesn't correlate with exacerbation of the diseases or the fact that you're getting a remission. If it goes away, you're less likely to relapse, but otherwise it's not very useful. <clears throat> Though generally successful treatment correlates with a reduced or absent C, uh, C anco. <clears throat> uh, what is the, this really should be the anca syndromes. Forget the C on there. There was a typo it didn't catch. Anca positive diseases have lytic necrotizing vascular pathology without immunoreactants. They're called posse immune. That means if you do immunostaining, you don't see like you do with lupus. There's no granular deposits. There's no anti-basement membrane immune deposits. There's nothing on standard H&E. 
Now recently there have been some studies with electron microscopy where they have found some small deposits, the significance isn't really clear, but currently we call this posse immune because the implication is that the humoral immune system really isn't involved directly in terms of immune complexes and causing these processes. <clears throat> it's important to realize that they're frequently patchy and segmental vascular involvement with the anchors. Think about what I told you about the glomeruli, that only part of a glomerulus is involved in their kind of random, uh, random effects throughout the kidney, so it's focal and segmental. <clears throat> they frequently have very prominent pulmonary injury and renal injury. The lung injury may re resemble a rapidly progressing pneumonia, sometimes with hemorrhage. It can be a diffuse capillaritis where you just bleed out suddenly. These diseases are potentially lethal very quickly, and it's very important you make the diagnosis uh, in microscopic polyangiitis and Wegener's as fast as you can because patients can go downhill very, very quickly in a matter of 24 or 48 hours. <clears throat> the kidneys show focal and segmental, posse immune. Again, when you do a, a biopsy, there doesn't appear to be any, any immunostaining, crescentic, rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis. The, uh, now, the P anchor is found in about 60% of patients with microscopic polyarteritis, about 40% are C anchor. So in microscopic polyangiitis, you can have it either way. You can have a P anchor or a C anchor. In Church strauss the vast majority are, are positive for the P anchor. And when they have P anchor, they're more likely to get pulmonary involvement. When they're, when they're P anchor negative, they're the studies have shown they're more likely to get cardiac involvement, which is equally serious. It's positive in some overlap syndromes with features of Churg Strauss, where you get asthma, eosinophilia, upper airway involvement. And it's positive in about a third of patients with rapidly progressive crescentic glomerulonephritis, which may be a, a Wegner's, a limited Wegner's type syndrome. So again, it's not, it's not entirely clear uh, with these things. It doesn't entirely make the diagnosis, but the C anchor would strongly, in, a, in the proper setting, a C anchor would, would strongly favor Wegener's. Uh, it may favor microscopic polyangiitis if you have less upper respiratory involvement. A P anchor could be microscopic polyangiitis or Churg Strauss if you have a lot of eosinophilia, asthma, and other things, okay? So that's the, <clears throat> the basic uh, idea here. Now what about the patient? What do you see? Anytime you need to consider vasculitis, anytime you have really unexplained multitude of constitutional symptoms, not just one or two, but you can get fever, fatigue, weight loss, malaise. <clears throat> you can have uh, parameters of inflammation, uh, elevated ESR, CRP, anemia, chronic disease, thrombocytosis. And anytime you have a multi-system disease, that's the key. When you have something you can't put together logically, there's kidney involvement, there's lung involvement, uh, there may be upper respiratory involvement, they have skin involvement, there's arthralgias, arthritis. So you have multi-systemic involvement, you need to start thinking about vasculitic syndromes. <clears throat> uh, polyarthritis uh, rheumatica. Again, anytime you consider the diagnosis of SBE, lymphoma, <clears throat> metastatic malignancy, FUO, collagen vascular disease, should always be in your differential because these things tend to overlap with multisystemic disease and if you, if you don't consider it, you may miss it. <clears throat> there are a multitude of CNS manifestations. You can get seizures, headaches, encephalopathy. You can have stroke-like syndrome, psychosis, mononeuritis multiplex, uh, mononeuropathies, all due to the compromised vasculature. It can affect the eye with episcleritis, uveitis, pseudotumor cerebri, pulmonary involvement, dyspnea, cough, hemoptysis, pulmonary hemorrhage, COPD. You can get nodules, fixed infiltrates that can mimic pneumonia, pleural effusions. <clears throat> Cardiovascular, pericarditis, constricted pericarditis, arteritis, myocardial infarction if you block off whole vessels, ischemia, arrhythmias, EKG changes, etc. GI, nausea, vomiting. Uh, melana, uh, diarrhea, bowel obstruction, etc. You can go through those on your own. Arthritis, arthralgias, muscle pain, weakness. Renal, active renal sediment, indicative of glomerulonephritis, renal insufficiency or failure, renal infarcts, hypertension. So what do you do if you're confronted with a patient with a vasculitis? <clears throat> you do a good history and physical exam always. You need tissue for the most part. You need to get whatever's involved to see if the histology supports what you're talking about in terms of primary inflammation of the vessels. So you go where the action is on that. If the skin is involved, you do the skin. 
you want to you want to biopsy the palpable purpura lesion. Ideally, you want to biopsy a lesion that's been present about two or three days, so it's well established. You can do immunofluorescence on a lesion that's uh, <clears throat> newer one or two days old. It's going to give you the best yield. But if you don't have the skin to biopsy, then you may want to do other tissues. You can do nerve conductions, perhaps for a sural nerve biopsy. Uh, you may need to be more invasive, uh, EMG muscle biopsy. <clears throat> if there's an active sediment and you're seriously considering a serious vasculitis, then you uh, certainly need to consider doing a, uh, a biopsy of the kidneys to rule out basement membrane disease and other processes that can mimic it. Uh, if necessary, a lung biopsy, it may be necessary to distinguish that from an infection or malignancy. Um, and you can do angiograms or MRAs uh, to document va vasculature. Laboratory workup, you're going to want all the usual stuff. It's important to get your analysis <clears throat> and have someone look at that or look at it yourself for uh, evidence of glomerulonephritis. Uh, if you have phase contrast microscopy, you can look for dysmorphic red cells where they've uh, extruded through the glomerular uh, membrane and get uh, damaged with that. Immune complex studies, I guess for academic interest, you may want to get an echocardiogram. You want to make sure that there's not an infection going on like hepatitis B or C. <clears throat> you also want to test for monoclonal gammopathies, immune complex disease with that. And I'm not going to touch a great deal on the vasculitis. There are some generalities that I want to go through. When you're dealing with small vessel vasculitis, like in the skin, uh, you can get skin and arthralgias mostly. There are a whole variety of anti-inflammatory drugs. We as dermatologists tend to throw lots of things at lots of different diseases. Uh, I call that light's law. That means when there isn't a good treatment for any disease, the multitude of treatments that are thrown at a particular disease is mute testimony to, or mute testimony to the fact that nothing works worth a damn consistently. Uh, and that's really what happens with this. So we do NSAIDs, colchicine. Usually what I'll do is for a period of time, uh, oral corticosteroids. I think they're the most effective and the fastest way to go. You don't need to do a, a high dose. You can do 20, 25 milligrams a day for a week and usually it'll, it'll be entirely gone. For more severe or unresponsive disease, you may want to go with a higher dose of corticosteroids and a taper per disease activity. And if it's <clears throat> really more severe, the, the other involvement, kidneys and whatever, you think about uh, immunosuppressive uh, drugs such as azathioprine, methotrexate, uh, mycophenolate, mofetil, et cetera. For the ankyposis, small and medium vessel vasculitis, there's a lot of controversy about that. There are guidelines. Generally, a rheumatologist is going to get involved with the care, but you want an initial induction to turn things off as quickly as you can. Traditionally, what's been done is uh, IV pulse solumedra, one gram over three to five days uh, as a slow push, and then moderate to high dose cyclophosphamide. Rituximab has come into its own in recent years as non inferior uh, with this. So, a lot of patients are being treated with rituximab and seem to be doing very well. If they're on steroids, you taper it slowly. Cyclophosphamide, you taper it slowly. And then they can do maintenance with methotrexate or azathioprine plus or minus the steroids. <clears throat> there are controversies with this. It's beyond the scope of this lecture, but it's pulse versus continuous cyclophosphamide, rituximab versus cyclophosphamide in terms of efficacy and side effects. As I said, most of the studies indicate non-inferiority and there are a lot less side effects with it. Uh, mycophenolate mofetil has its adherence and there are some other ways to treat these things. Uh, in terms of maintenance, whether you use uh, low-dose cyclophosphamide or azathioprine, azathioprine versus Celsept, <clears throat> uh, again, there's not a lot of data to argue for one or the other. There are guidelines that are published. It's interesting that uh, Bactrim seems to help with uh, the Wegener spectrum of disease and preventing relapses. And I've actually experienced that with leukocytoclastic vasculitis where I've had patients that have developed it over and over again. And I put them on antibiotics, the presumption being that somehow bacterial, chronic bacterial uh, infections or states or colonization has something to do with this. It's clear with very mild Wegners or Wegners that's limited to the upper respiratory tract that putting patients on Bactrim actually prevents relapses to a statistical degree. It also uh, will prevent pneumocystis, and, uh, which is of some concern too with uh, patients on chronic immunosuppression. For all patients that you anticipate putting on immunosuppression, this doesn't get done even by rheumatologists. I'm kind of surprised at that. But anytime you're considering that, you need to check them for TB, hepatitis B and C, and HIV. 
uh, early in therapy or before starting therapy because you can have reactivation of granulomatous disease that can be a disaster and you want to know. And in, in patients that have been otherwise vaccinated, uh, you may want to use the uh, uh, quantifiron gold uh, assay or if there's con any confusion or concern. You need to get a DEXA scan if they're a baseline DEXA scan if they're going to be on uh, prednisone for a long period of time and daily vitamin D3 and calcium to prevent osteopenia and osteoporosis. Uh, and you may want to use the prophylactic antibiotics Bactrim for secondary pneumocystis infections. So in a nutshell, that's where we're at. I want you to realize that you have the primary vasculitides. Everything else is kind of garbage and secondary and harder to understand. Uh, I want you to, to understand that the skin manifestations can give you an idea of what vessel size is involved. The vessel size is key to determining exactly what the syndrome is uh, there. And the ANCAs can be very helpful in delineating the, those four very serious diseases. But again, the ANCAs are only of value when combined with a disease that is consistent with one of the diagnoses. On themselves, with nonspecific changes, they're not useless and they're not useful, maybe misleading. Any general questions? Hope I didn't confuse things further. Just when you determine the size of the uh, size of the body distribution, how do you correlate? Like, is there numbers? Exact numbers? No, it's no, it's just subjective. I mean, what you're going to do is you're going to have one or several biopsies, and you're going to see to some extent a span, but I think if you even nail one, it's there. And that's how I disagree with the, with the Chapel Hill consensus. Because you can always say that there's, I think it's safe to say you can always get smaller vessels. It doesn't rule out anything above it. But if you nail that one vessel, you're there. So I think, you know, if you, do, if you, do, if you have granuloma, and it's a very loose granuloma by definition with, with Wegner's, but if you're C-anca, you got uh, respiratory lesions, otitis, you got nasal perforation, you got uh, renal involvement, and you get a C-anca, and you do a biopsy, and you get a, a medium, a small artery, I'm sorry, a small artery involvement, uh, or me, I should say medium artery involvement, you're, that's it, you're nailed as far as I'm concerned. I mean, that would be, you'd be fairly safe in assuming your diagnosis. I mean, you can argue either way with that, but no, it isn't, it's just seeing it, seeing it, even a singular vessel like that is sufficient, okay? With what now? The C and K and B and K, right? No, it, it doesn't. I'm saying there are patterns that can occur even within individual diseases. I didn't mean to confuse you with that, too. You don't need C or P ANCAs to make the diagnosis. There are, there are 5% of patients with Wegener's that don't have C or P ANCA. They still have Wegener's. So the lack of having, an, uh, of having that assay positive doesn't mitigate against the diagnosis. You'd like to have it, and it makes you question a little bit more, but you can have Wegner's without that. What I said was in, in Churg-Strauss syndrome, that when you have the, the, the patterns, the population patterns are, when you're P-ANCA positive, you tend to have more of the, of the renal involvement. And when, you when you're P-ANCA negative and you still have Churg-Strauss, so you tend to get more of the heart. There's also, again, not to confuse things, there are always exceptions. In China, they don't behave the same way we do on the C ANCAs. Most of their Wegeners is P ANCA positive in China for some reason. And it, the further you go up in North Korea, it's the same way. There are probably genetic aspects of this. But I think 60% of patients in China who have Wegeners are P ANCA positive, not C ANCA. So that's, in, that's directly opposed to the data that we've generated in our country here. So you need to take all these things into account. There are no absolutes. Uh, and whether they're there or not gives you, can give you some hint as to perhaps the course of your patient or the pattern. But again, not having these things doesn't mitigate strongly against the diagnosis. And having them not in the clinical setting doesn't impute the diagnosis. You have to take it as a, you know, as a total. You have to take the entire picture of what's going on by physical exam, laboratory parameters, pathology, and serologies, and then you try your damnedest to, you know, make a diagnosis on that. Any other questions? How sensitive is the anti-protein You'll get different figures. It's, the, the, it's anywhere from 80 to 80 to 95% are the figures that I've seen. So it's, 
<clears throat> it's not entirely sensitive. It's, it's, they said highly specific, but if you say 80%, that, I wouldn't call that highly specific. So, you know, I would question the, the terminology a little bit. But I mean, it's, it's a fairly good assay on that. Uh, and it certainly can be helpful in corroborating things. But again, none of these approach 90 or 100% from the literature that I'm reading. It's all, you know, 80 to 90% or so. Any other general questions? And again, the importance of making this diag these diagnoses is your patient can go south really quickly. This is a, these are medical emergencies. At least the, the ANCA positive diseases are. Uh, you can put a patient in the hospital and they'll be happy-go-lucky. And I've seen this happen where they're, they're doing very well. Uh, you know, you come back 24 hours later and they're in renal failure and they're crashing. You know, they're at death's doorstep. So you need to make the diagnosis as fast as you can. And in those settings, what you want to do probably is, you know, pulse them right away with corticosteroids to try to, to immediately stop whatever is going on with that and try to preclude some of the damage that's going to occur. Any other general questions? So <clears throat> I presented a lot of data. What I do is look through the handouts again. I would pay attention to the manifestations and that one slide that shows you the, uh, the distinctions based on vessel slide, whether there are granuloma or not. We didn't have time to go in the individual diseases. I'll let that up to your reading, but hopefully you'll be able to develop a separate unique concept of each of these diseases, understanding that there's a lot of basic overlap in their clinical manifestations, and as well to some degree in the serologies, the tests. Okay? Thank you.